subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello and you're welcome to SHS Hour here on your Joy Learning channel with me, Dennis Amoba. Today we are in the SHS2 class where we shall be learning English. And the aspect of English that we are learning today is grammar. And the topic and the grammar today is clauses. Clauses. Clauses and a grammar. So, I'd like us to look at what we are, will be expected to learn today in this class. By the end of the lesson, you'll be expected to describe and identify clauses in given contexts. You should be able to also distinguish between dependent and independent clauses. Then we will write sentences where we will be combining dependent and independent clauses. I'd like us to have a look at some constructions, some groups of words that we have here. See the first one, kweku, red, the story beautifully. If you write the letter, having finished addressing the journalists, the man in the red shirt, Sheila is cooking for the family. When you look at all of these groups of words or these constructions, you will notice that some of them have verbs because I know that in SHS2 you are able to identify verbs in groups of words. So when we look at the first group of words, we notice that uh -huh, red is the verb in that group. The second one, if you write the letter, what's the verb? Write is the verb. Then the second one, we have, the next one we have, having finished addressing all of that. Then we have the man in the red shirt. There is no verb. Sheila is cooking. For the family, we have is cooking. Great. So, based on these, we are going to learn what a clause is because I know you can identify verbs in groups of words or in any construction. Therefore, what is a clause? A clause is any construction that contains a verb and normally has a subject and predicate. A clause is any construction that contains a verb. The verb is very critical and normally has a subject and a predicate. But when we go back to look at the constructions that we looked at earlier, you notice that the first one, the first sentence, you have Kweku read the story beautifully. In that construction, we have read as the verb. Therefore, it qualifies to be called a clause. The second one, if you write the letter, what is the verb? Right. So that is also a clause. Having finished addressing, you see having finished addressing 
all of that. Express some action. Then the next one you have the man in the red shirt. The man in the red none of them is a verb. So that does not qualify to be called a clause. Sheila is cooking for the family. You notice that is cooking is a verb. Is a verb, cooking a verb. They come together to form what you learned in Form 1, a verb phrase. So that also qualifies as a clause. Therefore, our definition for a clause as being any construction that contains a verb and normally has a subject, a predicate, applies to about five of them. I think four of them. We have Kweku read the letter beautifully. If you write the letter, having finished addressing the journalist, and Sheila is cooking for the family. Now let's look at more examples. Or before we go that, go there. Let's look at this. There are two types of clauses, and that is what I'd like us to establish here, because there are definitions that are given when it comes to clauses, which are sometimes skewed. You know, it just looks at one side of what we call a clause or what construction we consider a clause. So in this particular lesson, I'd like us to know that any construction that has a verb in it is a clause. But then, clauses can be grouped into two. And these are finite clauses and non-finite clauses. Finite clauses and non-finite clauses. Let's look at these examples. Some examples of clauses here. When you see him, I am going home. Listening to the preaching, why she came home singing the choir? Are they in the studio? All of these are verbs. But then we have said that some verbs are finite and others are non finite. What do we mean when we say a verb is finite? We have to know that. By finite, we mean that we are looking at the verb whether it is present or past. So the present or the past form of the verb is the finite part we are talking about. So when we talk about finiteness, we are looking at tense, either present or past. Let's look at some examples here. In the table, you will find finite and non-finite verbs. And on the left side, I've written finite verbs. Under that, you see present, past. So the present forms of go you see go there, you have goes. And then we have sing, and you have sings. We also have the past form of sing or sings as sung. And then you have write, which goes to the third person, writes. And the past form of that is wrote. Sell, mm -hmm, sells. The past form, sold. Draw, draws. The past form, drew. Then you have have. The third person, has. And then the past form of have or has is had. Then we have do, does. The past form, did. Those 
are the finite forms of the verbs. When we want to look at the non-finite forms, then we are looking at the ing forms and what we call the past participle. The ing forms are called present participle and the en forms are called the past participle. So when I am talking about the finite forms of verbs, I'm looking at either the present or the past form. And the non-finite are the present participle and the past participle. Our understanding of these will help us to identify what a finite clause is and what a non-finite clause is. So that any time I find any group of words and I notice that the verb form there is finite, then I can say this is a finite clause. So let's look at these examples. These are also part of the finite form. These are the verb to be. So you have am, is, the past form is was, are, the past form is where. And their present participle is the B and ing, which is being. And then the past participle is the B E E N, that is the bin. All of them show finite and non finite. So now let's look at these examples. We are to classify the following into finite and non finite clauses because we have now understood what a finite verb is and what a non-finite verb is. So our job now is to classify these based on our knowledge of the fact that a finite verb is either present or past and the non-finite is the ing form or the past participle form. So do that quickly for me. Okay, I hope you were able to find these ones. Finite clauses, we have was, which is the past form of the verb to be, is or am. So that qualifies to be considered a finite clause. And it has the subject, which is the I. So then it qualifies to be considered a clause. Then the next one, he spoke to me. You have he spoke, the past form of speak. Then it's also finite. Then we have how he got here, got, the past form of get. So that is also finite. Then whenever you are ready, ah is the present form of the verb to be where, which is the past. So R makes this construction finite, and so that's a finite clause. Let's look at the other one, non-finite clauses. You see, having seen, having the ing form, and the seen, the participle of C. And then when used, we don't know whether this is present or past. It is also a non-finite form of the verb use. It doesn't have a subject, so we are unable to tell whether it is present or past. But it is a non-finite form. Then before becoming a world champion, the ING form becoming a world champion. The last one, seeing no one outside, seeing. Yeah. So all of these are non-finite clauses. That settles it, that clauses can be grouped into finite and non-finite. And for me to be able to identify a clause as finite, I must come to the understanding that that clause has either the present form or the past form of the verb. If it is non-finite, 
then it means I have the ING participle or the EN participle. Good. So now let's look at these. These are things you have to do for me. You have to identify the clauses in each sentence quickly. Because you have said that a clause is any construction that contains a verb and normally has a subject and predicate. So do that for me. I know you'll be able to do this. Okay, let's see how many clauses you are able to identify in each of the sentences. Now, were you able, I'm sure you were able to find these. In the first sentence, we have Amugi called me. The other side is as soon as he got home. The teacher is absent. The other side, because he's not, he's ill. Because he's ill. The next one, if you listen carefully, you will hear the sound. Our next sentence, I was in my room when Shirley came home. Even though Kofi tried hard, he failed the course. You notice that all of these that we have identified have verbs in them. And these verbs are finite. They are either present or past. So for our purpose at the SHS level, we always consider clauses as any construction that contains a finite verb and has a subject and predicate. So that is what we are doing today. We would like to find out how these clauses come together. When you look at these clauses, as I have indicated with a red color, you will notice that these are words that introduce some clauses. And these words, when they are not there, we will have more or less sentences that can stand alone. These words that come before those sentences do not allow those sentences to make complete thought, as it were, because we learned in SHS 1 that a sentence is any group of words that make a complete thought. Therefore, when we look at the first part of the first sentence, Amugi called me. You understand that perfectly. It is complete in itself. But if you look at the other side, as soon as he got home, if someone said as soon as he got home and stopped, you would ask, mm -hmm. So you notice that the ones with the red color are unable to make complete thought. And those words that are in front of those groups of words are called subordinating conjunctions. You learned that in SHS 1. In SHS 1, we learned conjunctions, but I'll review them with you. So let's look at some examples of subordinating conjunctions. Here are some examples. When if, because, so that, as though, while, after, when, even though, though, that, where, as long as, as soon as. There are many more. 
when you see these structures coming before any group of words that has a subject and predicate, then you refer to that group as a clause which cannot stand alone. We have a name for it. We learned that even in JHS, we say that clause is dependent. So subordinating conjunctions will make constructions that were otherwise sentences on their own dependent on other sentences. That is why they call them subordinate. In JHS, you learn something called main clauses and subordinate clauses. The subordinate clause has a subordinating conjunction. That means it does not allow that clause to make complete sense, if you like. It's unable to stand on its own. It needs the other part to be able to make complete sense. So let's look at some of these examples. And this is what I'd like us to do. We are to identify the independent and dependent clauses in each sentence. I've given you some sentences and you are to identify the independent and the dependent clauses. Because we said that when we say a clause is independent, it means it can stand on its own. Those that are dependent cannot stand on their own. So look at the clauses there, the sentences, and identify the independent and the dependent clauses. Good. I am sure you were able to identify all the independent clauses as well as the dependent clauses. Let's look at them. I want to believe that you got them right. Good. So in the first sentence, we see that the independent clause is everyone becomes worried. Everyone becomes worried. It's understood. But then somebody would want to find more information. And that extra information you will get will be found in the dependent clause. And that is what we have there whenever it rains heavily in our country. That structure depends on everyone becomes worried. Our next sentence, we have Abu will pass all his papers. That is understood. But then if he said, if he said this hard, that is the condition under which Abu will pass his exam. So if you just say, if he studies hard, mm -hmm, somebody will be waiting for you. They would want to get a better understanding of what you mean. And so you say, Abu will pass all his papers, they will not go. They would want you to talk. So that part which cannot make complete thought is what we call dependent clause. And we have said that a clause is any construction that has a verb. At a level, we are saying that a clause is any construction that has a finite verb and normally has a subject and predicate. Our next one is even though he is wealthy, mm -hmm, somebody will ask you. It doesn't make complete thought. So we go to the next part. He is not happy. If someone said Kofi is not happy, you will understand. But probably you would want to find out why. So maybe Kofi is not happy because he doesn't have money. Kofi is not happy will make sense because he doesn't have money. Do a reason, but it depends on Kofi is not happy. So that is what. I wanted us to understand that we have clauses that can be independent or dependent. Independent clauses can stand on their own and make complete thought. Dependent clauses are not. They are introduced by the word I told you 
you about subordinating conjunctions. Whenever you see them, you have to know that that part will need another part to make sense. So, as we said, you look at this one. We visit her. Because she advises us all the time. If someone just said, because he advises all, us all the time, he would want to find out, mm hmm. And you see the subordinating conjunction there, because. If you didn't bring because, that structure she advises us all the time will make complete sense. But as soon as you add that subordinating conjunction, then that whole structure requires another structure to make sense or to make complete sense. And that is why we have we visit her. That is the reason why we visit her. Why do we visit her? Because she advises us all the time. Then the next one, while Na appreciated the honor, mm -hmm, we need something to be able to understand that structure. She could not accept the position. That is the main clause. Na could not accept the position. And we want to find out why. Okay, so while Na appreciated the honor, that is dependent on she could not accept the position. Maybe there are certain reasons we must know. So all that we are saying is that a dependent clause requires an independent clause to make sense. And they are heralded or introduced by subordinating conjunctions, some of which we have given. Because, after, as soon as, if, so that. And they have functions. Some will give us reasons, some will show us purpose, some will show time, others will give us concession. We will look at that. So these are some clauses I have given and I'm expecting you to join them using some of these subordinating conjunctions. I am pretty sure you'll be able to do this because they are things that you, you are capable of doing. So we are to join the following clauses into sentences. I'm waiting. I know you do this in no time. There are only three. Great. I know you have finished joining them. Let's, let's look at them quickly. I'm sure you were able to write this. Kofi slept early last night because he was very tired. So you use the subordinating conjunction because and then you added Kofi was very tired because you didn't have to repeat Kofi you now introduce the pronoun he to replace Kofi so Kofi slept early last night because he was very tired the next one you had even though I saw her at the party I couldn't speak with her I saw her at the party. I couldn't speak with her. You join these two clauses with a subordinating conjunction, even though. And we can interchange the positions. I couldn't speak with her, even though I saw her at the party. So we have beautifully joined the two clauses using the subordinating conjunction. Then the next one, if. You tell me the truth, you will be pardoned. You see the first part? If you tell me the truth. That cannot stand alone. You will be pardoned. Is the main clause. And if you tell me the truth, is the subordinate clause, which is introduced by the subordinating conjunction if. Or you can say that you will be pardoned as the 
independent clause. And if you tell me the truth, it's the dependent clause. It depends on you be pardoned to make complete sense. Or your being pardoned is dependent on your telling me the truth. Good. Now let's look at these ones. I'd like you to do this exercise for me quickly. And then you go ahead. We have some clauses on the left and some on the right. I'd like you to join them appropriately for me. Form your own sentences. Great. I am confident that you have been able to do all the five correctly, looking also at meaning, not just joining the clauses. Each of them will have to, you know, be joined or linked to another that makes sense. So meaning is also critical. We are not just looking at the clauses as just clauses and combining them. I hope you have been able to do that. Let's look at the expected answers. So this is what I expected you to do. You were to join the sentences as, because I had an integrated science exam to take, I studied throughout the night. I studied throughout the night is the independent clause. And then, because I had integrated science examination to take is the dependent clause. And that is introduced by the subordinating conjunction because. Great. The next one, although Ochibia was ill, she attended class today. What's the main clause there? She attended class today. And the subordinating clause, although Ochibia was ill. Okay, and that is introduced by the subordinating conjunction, although. So that is a dependent clause. And the independent clause is she attended class today. The third example, I know that you have enjoyed the class. What's the main clause? I know. Great, I know. And from that, you have enjoyed the class, is the dependent clause. So when you join them, you have, I know that you have enjoyed the class. The next one, my father had traveled when we were robbed. What's the main clause? My father had traveled. Good. And the subordinate clause, when we were robbed. And when is the subordinating conjunction introducing the dependent clause? Then we have, as soon as the students saw the teacher, they ran into the bush. What is the main clause there? They ran into the bush. And the subordinate clause, as soon as they saw the students saw the teacher. As soon as it's the subordinating conjunction, and therefore it makes that part of the structure, the clause, dependent on they run into the bush. So that part, as soon as the students saw the teacher, is the dependent clause. And then they run into the bush is the independent clause. Independent because it can stand on its own and make complete thought. Great. Thus far, what have we learned today? Today we have said that when we have any construction that contains a verb, we will call that construction a clause. However, Verbs can be either finite 
and non-finite. As I said, clauses can either be finite or non-finite. And we have said that the finite clauses have finite verbs. We have said finite verbs are either past or present form of the verb. And the non-finite clauses will contain the ing form or the en form. So for instance, if I have a verb like go, go, goes, and went are the finite forms. And the non-finite forms are going and gone. So as we saw in our examples, we noticed that we could have verbs such as these. You have go, goes, then went as the finite forms, and then going and gone as the non-finite. Therefore, if I had sentences such as these, having seen the dog, you have the ing form, which is a non-finite. So that becomes a non-finite clause. But when I look at, for instance, he spoke to me. Spoke is the finite form of the verb speak, and it is the past form, so it's finite. That makes that clause a finite clause. When we go to whenever you are ready, are is, the, is a finite form because it is present. The past form is where. Therefore, that is a finite clause. But our focus at the SHS level is to look at finite clauses. So we said that a clause is any construction that has a verb and normally a subject and predicate. But we will be looking at a verb in terms of it being finite, not in terms of it being non-finite. So the definition has always been a clause is a group of words, usually with a subject and predicate, and that it has a finite verb. We have also learnt that clauses can be grouped into dependent and independent. We looked at these sentences, and you notice that we had Amugi called me. Amugi called me as soon as he got home. We noticed that Amugi called me can stand on its own. As soon as he got home, because it has this subordinating conjunction, as soon as, then that part cannot stand on its own. So we call that one a dependent clause. But Amugi called me as an independent clause, which means it can stand on its own. Today, what we have tried to do is to understand what a clause is. We have said that a clause is a group of words or any construction which contains a verb and normally has a subject and predicate. We have also said that clauses can either be finite or non-finite. We have also understood that clauses can be independent or dependent. And we have illustrated that, uh, illustrated that with some examples, as I have here. We meet again some other time to continue with a sentence. So we do that. It's been exciting on your SHS R platform, which is the Joy Learning Channel, with me, Dennis Amoba. Thank you very much for making time to be here with me. Till then, see you again. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.